morning. Shabbat shalom, everyone. It's, um, it's very nice having all of you here, and we, we're truly grateful. Um, yeah, can we just start off with prayer? Just bow our heads and just come before the Father. Father, we thank you so much for just yet another beautiful day. Father, we submit and commit this time to you. We just pray that every heart will be ready to receive, Father. Every ear will be ready to hear what it is that you want to speak to us, Father. We ask that you will anoint our speakers, that you will speak through them, Father, and that you will just bless this time, that you will just be with us, that you will come and rejoice with us, Father, as we submit our lives to you, as we follow the way that Yeshua, Jesus, walked, Father, that you will just write your instructions in our hearts, and that we will do them, Father, that we will be doers of the world, and that you will just bless us in the mighty name of Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. Hey everybody, it's Zach again at NewTutorial.com. <laughs> all right, all right, let's just start off with a word of prayer real quick. Abba, Father, we just come to you. We're so blessed and um, in an amazing country with amazing people. And uh, Father, I was reminded last night that where your people gather, that's where the righteous are. And there are people in this building who are righteous. They're seeking after your Torah. They're seeking to know truth. They're w willing to follow you and to follow your word. And so, Father, we ask you to have mercy on this land and to bring rain. And so this is what we need, Father. We're asking you, you, you will remember your people. You will give us grace and favor. Give us the favor you have promised your people. And so, Father, we just look forward to this week. We know we're going to be blessed. We know we're going to be, we're going to enjoy the time you've set apart for us, especially starting on the Shabbat. And we ask your blessing upon all of it. We ask all this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay. This is a beautiful country. Um, I, I could not believe I'm in South Africa. <laughs> I, I was asked to go to Denmark um, uh, about a year ago, and co I couldn't do it. Uh, it was my first overseas trip for Newt's Torah. And so uh, when they asked me to come to South Africa, I said, yes, I can do that. Um, looked at my schedule. Yeah, I can do that. Wintertime is always easier for me because of the amount of responsibilities. They don't go away, but they're definitely less. And so this gives me the opportunity to do some things in the winter. And I only do a few events a year because really my priority is to my family and to my children and uh, being the father and husband they, they need me to be. And so I only do, you know, when it comes to ministry, a few events a year. And uh, they got me right at the right time. And I think that was the father's plan. So um, beautiful country. They're showing me around. Uh, it's, it's so gorgeous out there. It's green and growing. I don't know where all the rest of you are from, but uh, this is a very nice spot for me to start. <laughs> So uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things today. Um, we'll probably go down some rabbit trails, uh, but I want to concentrate on the agrarian roots. So what I'm going to talk about this weekend is going to be the greater exodus. We're going to start that tonight, you know, to this afternoon when I speak again. And, but we're going to start off with something a little bit new that you haven't seen on my website. It's only something I give out to conferences when I go and, and speaking events. And so we're going to talk about the agrarian roots of the Hebrew people because this is something I believe that's very important. As the Father is drawing his people out of Babylon, out of Egypt, he's preparing his people to move. There's some things I think we need to remember. We are disconnected in a, in a very big way from a lot of things that we need to be reminded of. And so that's what this is about, the agrarian roots of the Hebrew people. And so we're going to go back and, and visit some things. First off, oh, i got to plug this in. All right, that should do it. Yes, this is my family. Uh, we live on an American homestead. How many have seen the YouTube channel, An American Homestead? OK, they kicked us off YouTube, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> if you've seen them following that whole drama, but uh, we're still putting up lots of information on other websites like Steemit, and we're still on Roku as well. If you have Roku here, I don't know if they have that in South Africa, but we're on a variety of different platforms where we share our experiences in living an off-grid lifestyle. And so we don't have electricity. We have the only electricity we have is from solar panels. Uh, we don't have municipal water. We get all of our water from wells and from rainwater catchment. We don't have sewer. We do composting toilets. And we reuse our waste, and we compost that and, and, and use that for fruit trees and things like that. So we're off the grid. The only tie to the grid that I have is one DSL line that comes up my mountain. It's very slow, but it's faster than dial-up, if you remember dial-up. And um, it allows me to connect with you all back home. And so that is all powered by the solar panels. So that's the only tie to the grid that we have. 
But this is my family, my wife and two boys, and my mother-in-law and father-in-law live with us on the homestead. We each have our own house. And um, it's, it's a great time. And so if you haven't checked that out, please check out An American Homestead. You can see a different side, whereas New to Torah is more about the ministry and about the Torah and, and, and what I'm learning, I'm sharing with you all, uh, whereas American Homestead is about our off-grid lifestyle. And I know a lot of people enjoy it. So that's us. I always start off this way. I'm not a teacher, okay? I'm a student. I know a lot of people try to portray me as a teacher. Okay, I'm just a regular guy who struggles with the same sins everyone else does. Okay, I put my pants on the same way every morning that you do. Okay, and I'm a student. I'm learning. You know, we're all new to Torah. No one's ever going to be old to Torah. Moses might qualify, but other than that, you know, he still made mistakes. You know, we're all new to Torah. We're always constantly in this journey, learning what the Father is going to share with us. And I reserve the right to be wrong about everything you're about to see throughout the weekend. You know, I, I, I don't think I'm wrong, <laughs> but I might be. I wouldn't be wasting your time if I thought I was, okay? So I'm up here, I'm just sharing you with what I've learned in my studies, and people have found that helpful. And so we go from there. <laughs> ah! Okay, uh, what happens when we first discover Torah? So what happens when we first discover Torah? There's a whole variety of things that happen to us, emotions that come over our bodies, and, and we just we can't believe what we're seeing. And so we see some things that happen, some changes. The first one we, is we do, we reevaluate ourselves. Okay, we learn what sin is. Sin is transgression of the law. And so we look back at our lives, we reevaluate, and we're like, you know what, I've been doing this lifestyle, or I've been living this way, or I've been, you know, practicing this, and it's wrong in the eyes of the Father. And so we begin to reevaluate, we audit ourselves, and we take account, and then we seek forgiveness, because we're trying to live in a way that will be pleasing to Him. So that's one thing that happens. Many begin to learn Hebrew. How many of you have learned, began to learn some Hebrew? Some words here and there, maybe you're studying a little bit. Yeah, that's something that usually happens. A lot of people are uh, going through classes, they're learning the alphabet, they're learning what the letters mean, that they're alphanumeric, they're learning all kinds of meaning in the text when it comes to uh, the letters of, uh, of the Hebrew alphabet. And it's an amazing journey to learn that. My kids are learning Hebrew, you know, slowly but surely. I'm learning Hebrew, <laughs> you know. So that's one of the things that happens when we discover Torah. Many go on weird diet cleanses. How many of you have done that? Yeah? You know, you've been eating junk your whole life, and you're like, oh my goodness, I have, you know, this is the, the body the Father created, and I have trashed it. And so you start to get out the vacuum cleaners or your body, and you start, you know, washing things out, and there's all kinds of diet cleanses that are out there today, and people do that, and me and my wife went through a number of them, because, you know, I've been eating pork and all this stuff that the Father says isn't food. I've got to clean my body. And so you see a lot of people, they're doing diet cleanses. It's very common. And many study. Many of us study and we study and we study. We spend hours upon hours in our Bibles and, and learning apologetics and how to defend what we believe. We spend hours and hours, days and weeks and months on this. And it's a, it, that's a, a journey that's never going to stop or should never stop because you can always read the Torah again and learn something new that year. How many people do Torah portions? Yeah, lots of you. And so you're studying, you're learning, okay? You have a, a desire and a, and a, and a healthy uh, yearning and hunger for knowledge. And many, lastly, begin to yearn for an escape. Because you look around you, and you're in the city, maybe you're not, but you look around you and you see all of the sin that's around you. And it, and it begins to burden your heart. It begins to ache. Because you know what the Father is looking at. You, you realize that you are part of this sin, and it hurts the Father. And so you take on some of the attributes of the Father when you discover Torah, because what hurts him now hurts you. And you begin to want to find a way out. How do I get out of here? See, this is the cry that the Hebrews made the first time during the first exodus. It says they cried out, verse 23 of chapter 2. They cried out, and the Father heard their cry because they yearned for an escape from their bondage. Let me suggest to you, the bondage was just not hard labor. It was also the sin that surrounded them. 
that enveloped them. So much so, they, they became desensitized to it and didn't even know what sin was anymore, so that when the Father took them out into the wilderness, he had to reteach them what sin was. He had to give them the commandments because they had forgotten it. But they knew it was wrong. We can look around today. I mean, that's one of the things, the driving forces, at least in America, that's driving people to Torah. It's because we look at some of the things around us and we know it's wrong. It tugs at our heartstrings. Our consciousness are te is telling us that what we're seeing is wrong. You know, that's the Father's spirit inside of us. That's his, him pulling at our heartstrings to wake us up. How many of you have seen this movie? You know what this movie is? Someone say it out loud. The Karate Kid. So, um, yeah, so I was asking, um, <laughs> I was asking Tian yesterday, I said, oh, we're driving down the road, and I'm like, oh no, I just remembered. And I, I quickly flipped to the slide on my phone, I said, has anyone seen this movie? Do you know what this movie is? And he's like, oh yeah, that's Karate Kid. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> because I, I didn't know if you had seen this movie in this country, you know, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's very pivotal to my entire presentation. <laughs> Wait, stop. We have to watch the movie first. Then we'll come back. So, um, yeah, he said, okay, yeah, we know this movie. It's okay. Great. Good. So, um, Mr. Miyagi, this part of the movie, if you remember this part of the movie, Mr. Miyagi is talking to Daniel, young Daniel. And Daniel's frustrated. Because, you know, he came to the master to learn karate, to be a student of karate, to teach him karate. Because he had all these kids picking on him. A friend of mine gave me this analogy a, a few years back, and it's a guy who lives near, nearby where I live. And it was a beautiful analogy, and I use it quite often. Um, and it's this movie where Mr. Miyagi is counseling young Daniel because Daniel is frustrated. Because, you know, he's had all these kids picking on him, and he wants to learn how to defend himself. Well, it seems like Mr. Miyagi, the master, all he's doing is putting him to work. He's doing all his chores for him, waxing the car and painting the fence and sanding the floor, right? And then young Daniel's like, hey, listen, I came to you to learn karate. And Mr. Miyagi at this scene here shows him that he has been learning karate. He's been learning by doing, wax on, wax off, right? Paint the fence, blocking a kick, you know, sand the floor. You know, these are all things that he was learning, muscle memory that the young student was learning from the master. This Eastern mindset is the same thing with Hebrew, okay? You learn by doing. So when you're new to this walk, you begin to walk it out by doing what our ancestors did. You learn what they knew by doing what they did, okay? Doing the feast. How many, how many people have been doing the feast? You've been doing the feast for a long time. Every year, you learn more because something is, is newly revealed to you, you know? And so how many of us have been doing the feast for at least five years or more? Every time you do it, you learn more. You learn more. You look back at the, at the sacrifice of our Messiah when he came, and you see the pictures, the shadow pictures in the feast, what they represent. And so it's meaningful by what you do. Make sense? All right. So... Um, Mr. Miyagi, he's teaching young Daniel's son. We are young Daniel's son. The master is trying to teach us through doing. That's what we need to be doing. We, a lot of times we're not going to understand it. We just need to go ahead and do it. It's the same way with the agricultural roots of the Hebrew people. Okay? The Hebrew people were agricultural based. They were he, agriculture people. Okay? They lived in tents. They stayed away from the cities. They had their own cities in, in the land, but they were an agriculturally based society. And that's very important. So much of the Bible has come alive for me and my family once we started living an agrarian-based lifestyle. We began to understand the writings and scriptures so much more when we, we put them into practice in the context of actual experience. Okay, You look at the things you'll never understand if you don't do them yourselves. I'll give you a number of examples today. That's what we're here for. I'm saying that, am I saying that you must live an agrarian-based lifestyle? No. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you have to move to a farm if you're not on one. How many people live on a farm here? A few of you, okay. I'm not saying that you have to leave the city and move on a farm, okay. What I am saying, you will never fully understand the writers of the Bible unless you live an agrarian-based lifestyle. You're going to miss some things. I'm going to prove it to you here today. This is New York City, one of the largest cities in the world. 
Okay. Um, anybody ever been there? Okay, a few of you. Good. Do you think a cab driver living in New York City will ever fully understand the lifestyle of a cattle rancher living in Texas? Likewise, do you think that cattle rancher in Texas will ever fully understand the lifestyle of the cab driver living in New York City? Nope. Not unless they switch roles and try it out for a while. It's the same thing with the Bible. The cab driver will never fully understand the cattle rancher, and the cattle rancher will never fully understand the cab driver. So when we look at the writers of the scriptures, what kind of lifestyle did they live? It was agriculturally based. How many of us are living an agriculturally based lifestyle today? Very few. At least in America, very few. In fact, the rural areas of America are constantly losing population every year. Because the kids are growing up, what, you know, the kids that were raised in those places, and they're moving to the city. It's the draw. It's the draw of lights and shiny things. It's really the draw of sin. And sin gets them and grabs them and doesn't let go. You've got to fight to get out of it. Let's go to some verses. Genesis 13, verse 5. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so the night they could not dwell together. In verse 7, And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be therefore no strife, I pray thee, between thee and me and thee, and between my herdmen and your herdmen, for we are brothers." Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If you will take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you will depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld in all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east and they separated themselves from the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked, <clears throat> and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. You know, you can make a good case for righteousness being associated with the wilderness when you look at your Bible, read your scriptures. It's amazing. I never noticed it before. I had to move there before I could see that. It was the act of being separate from others. Hodesh, holy, set apart, sanctified. That's what that means. Separate yourself from something else. The patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's sons, they all lived in an agrarian lifestyle. They all dwelled, for the most part, in the wilderness. Moses and the Hebrews, where did the father take them? Into the wilderness. i got to get you separate. I gotta have you spend time with me, the father says. You know, I gotta get you away from all this junk. You know, that's the only way you're gonna learn. I need time alone with my people, with my bride. Most of the prophets, I mean, find me a prophet that spent most of its time, I mean, a majority. They all spent time, most of the time, in the wilderness. And the father spoke to them there. When the Hebrews came out of Egypt to the wilderness, it was time to get close to the father, to know the father. You gotta get you gotta close off your ears. There's too much noise and distractions in the cities. You got your job calling you all the times. You got, you know, all, you know, the, the, you know, the social, you know, things that are happening with friends and, and relatives and neighbors and there's all a distraction. The TV's always on, the radio, politics, whatever. There's always stuff going that's trying to vie for your attention when the father just wants to have time with you. Shabbat's good, but you know, what if you could spend a lot of time with the Father? Luke 5.16, and he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed, speaking of our Messiah. I want to get close to the Father, I'm going to the wilderness. Let's go spend some time with Dad. You know, he wants to speak to me. The Father will once again bring us into the wilderness. This is the greater exodus. We have verse after verse. We're going to talk about this this week, or t tomorrow and tonight and tonight. We're going to go through a lot of verses. It's going to happen again. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Speaking of Israel as a people. Hosea 
This is a future time. It hasn't happened yet. All the prophets speak of it, both major and minor. So here's the deal. At some point, it's going to be a good thing to get to the wilderness. Beat the rush. <laughs> Being in the wilderness is a good thing, and it's going to teach you a lot about your Bible. Trust me. We're going to go through that today. So Bible things and Bible ways. <clears throat> Here's the first example. It's a good example. It's probably the best example I can give you. I think all of them are very good, but this is the best. Sheep equals people. How many times have you read in your scriptures and it refers to sheep and people as being the same? Over and over and over ad nauseum, it speaks of sheep and people being the same. Yeah, have you ever noticed how many times the Bible refers to people as sheep? Here's one, Jeremiah 50, verse 17. Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. Ezekiel 34, verse 6. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after him, after them. Sheep and people. And we like sheep have gone astray. We like sheep. We've gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And again, another verse referring to people as sheep. Psalms 95, verse 7. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. People, sheep. I mean, we all see this, right? It's pretty clear. People are sheep. So I'm going to share with you now an interesting study on human behavior with that in mind. People are sheep. How many of you have ever been here? Anybody ever seen this before? This is the St. Louis City Arch. Downtown St. Louis, where I'm from. I was born and raised in downtown St. Louis, or downtown, in St. Louis. In St. Louis is one of the largest monuments in the United States. It's even bigger than the Statue of Liberty by quite a bit. It's the St. Louis City Arch. It was constructed back in 1964, I believe, and took about a year to build. And uh, it's gigantic. There's a huge park on both sides in between it, and it's called the Gateway to the West. And that is because when new settlers were coming uh, to America, they would reach St. Louis, and St. Louis was the starting point to all of the other wilderness that went laid to the west. And so people got their last final supplies in St. Louis, and then they traveled west. And so it became known as the gateway to the west. Has anybody ever at least seen a picture of it before? Okay, great. So what I would do is I would go down here on, you know, the weekends or, you know, sometimes during the week, and I would take gospel tracts. You want to know what a gospel tract is? Okay. I would use these $1 million bills. They were great. They always get people's attention. You, people love it when it looks like you're handing them money, right? <clears throat> so, and on the back of the million dollar bill, it gives the gospel. You know, it tells them that you're, you know, you're a liar, you're a thief. We've all taken the Lord's name in vain. We've all looked at a woman with lust. And so we're guilty of breaking God's law. And that makes us sinner. And it makes us, a, makes us condemned. And that we need salvation. And then at the very end of giving the gospel, at the very last sentence, it says, go home, read your Bible. That's where I got that. <laughs> Actually, it says, go read your Bible and obey it. But, you know, I just changed a little. <clears throat> so I would give these gospel tracts out every day or whenever I went down there for, you know, a full day. And um, I'd stand at one side inside these woods here. And there's these giant paths that we, there's these giant parking lots on both sides of the arch where people can park and come to it, Right. And they're walking down these big paths. And it was unbelievable to me. It only took me a couple times of being there before I noticed it. And I would hand out the gospel tracts. And if one person took it, like there, there'd be a group who would come up on the elevator from the, from the parking garages. And they'd all get off or get off at the stairs at the same time and come as a group. And you'd get you know, groups like every five-minute intervals or so, something like that, right? And you'd give the gospel tract. If the first person took the gospel tract, they all took it. If the first person rejected the gospel tract, they all rejected it. It wasn't, even, it wasn't, it was amazing. It wasn't even like they were paying attention. It was just subliminal. The people would all be walking all scattered and the first person would take it and whether the other person was paying attention or not, it just sent out a negative vibe if they didn't take it. And then the rest of them didn't take it. And if the first person took it, the other person was like, hmm, what's he got? And they're like, what's he got? You know, and so, and so they, they want one. They want to see what the first person took because no one wants to be left out. 
But if the subliminal vibe went out that, oh, what he's given isn't good, then it, it spread to the rest of the pack. And then they were like, no, 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 no. Every once in a while, you get someone who was curious, you know, and then they wad it up and throw it on the floor. But it was amazing. And I came home and I told my wife, I said, you're not going to believe this. I could not understand it. It was like some kind of weird mind control thing. I had never seen something like that before. And then <laughs> I got sheep. <clears throat> How many people here, anyone here ever owned sheep? Okay, great. Hey, Amy, anybody here ever own goats? A few people, okay. Anyone ever own both? Have both? Okay, so some of you guys might see what, know what I'm about to say. <clears throat> Hold on a second. Yeah. So this is Matthew 25, verse 31. It says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall he gather all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Folks, when I got sheep, I understood what happened at that arch because it's the same thing. If, if you're going to feed the sheep or you're going to go out into the pasture, you got to do some work out there or work, do some fencing work. If one sheep decides to come check out to see what you're doing, they all come. If one sheep gets a little skittish and decides, oh, no, I'm not going over there, then they all go away. They all would run from you. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And then it dawned on me, this is why the father equates his people as sheep. Okay? Then the goats. I've owned goats on two separate occasions. Both of them were absolute nightmares. <laughs> I'll never do it again. I'm going to explain. One day, uh, we were going to build a feeder. Okay? And it was going to be two by four construction. I don't know if you know what two by fours are. Uh, two inch by four inch construction. <laughs> um, it's just wooden construction with some wire. And, it, and I built a feeder that would keep their hay off the ground because we had this issue with parasites where I live that are on the ground. And if they eat food off the ground, they get sick. So I was building this feeder and I built it off the ground. And I thought I did a really good job with this thing. And then I gave it to the goats and I put the hay in there and I put it out there. I'm all proud. I'm standing back and looking at it. I'm like, oh, this is great. It looks, it looks nice. And the next day, I came back, and it was completely destroyed. Because the goats were ramming into it with their heads. They were standing in it. They were pooping in it. They, they, were, they were climbing all over it, and they had, they had pulled off the wiring and just destroyed the thing. Then one day, I built a feeder for sheep. And you know what they did? They ate out of it. <laughs> it was the most amazing thing. They actually used it for what its purpose was. But the goats destroyed it. And I began to understand, sheep and goats. You see, I would have never figured that out had I not experienced it for myself. Does that make sense? And so the scripture became alive to me. It, be, it had more meaning. And I saw myself as a sheep. And I understood that there are people in this world, as hard as we try to reach them, they're just goats. And that's how the Father sees them. And one day he's going to have to separate us. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. So sheep, here's the definition of a sheep, my, from my experience. While they often go astray, they are quick to respond to the master's voice. How many of you sheep who have owned sheep know that? You know, they go astray. They often get into trouble. Sometimes you have to go rescue a sheep because they make a stupid decision. That's us. We all make stupid decisions. We often go astray and get involved in things that we ought not be involved in. But you know what? When correction comes, we hear the correction. And, we're, and, and we will repent. And we will you know, find a way to make it right. OK, that's the difference. Now, a goat. They are obstinate. And they are always testing their limits. And they are hard to respond to instruction. I have a neighbor who has goats, and you drive up their driveway, and you park the car to go visit and say hello, and first thing the goats do is jump on the car, and, and see who, and they fight who can get to the top first. <laughs> it's amazing. And I'm just like, why do you keep those animals around here? You just, your cars are destroyed, you know? 
And it, they do that with everything. They're, but they're always, you put a new fence up for a goat, and they're like, how can I get out of this? A goat gets up every morning, I'm not kidding you, a goat gets up every morning and says, how can I kill myself today? <laughs> I, have, I have had a number of goats from the times we've owned them that have, you put them out on a leash or you get them on a fence and they have killed themselves. They get their necks caught in the fence because they're trying to get out or they're trying to test their limits and they end up strangling themselves or electrocuting themselves or they wrap themselves around a tree with a rope and, 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 the, and you come out there and they're dead. And it's like, what happened? It's a goat. <laughs> and the sheep, you put them out in the pasture and they respect the fences. Sometimes they, they'll, they'll test their, their limits, but not often. You know, not very often, but they'll respect the fence. They respect the barrier. You know, they understand the master wants them here. Now, sometimes they're stupid. Like if I have a pasture that the, the, the grass has been all eaten down and I want to get them to a new pasture, I'll have to chase them around. I'm like, you don't understand. I'm just trying to get you to greener pastures. You know, the master's trying to help them and they don't see that, you know, that I'm trying to help them. And so it's hard to get them into the corral and get them, you know, to the other pasture. But you know, eventually they figure it out. And they're like, oh, okay, now I see what you were doing. You know, and they're like, ooh, new grass. We're that way with the Father sometimes. How many times has an obstacle raised up in your life? And you're like, why is he, why is this happening? Why is the Father putting this tribulation you know, in my life? And then all of a sudden, after time, it dawns on you, the Father wanted you somewhere else. And then he begins to bless you, you know, with the green grass that you're now eating, right? It's happened to all of us. Goats and sheep, I'll never own goats again. <laughs> He'll say, he shall uh, set the sheep on his right and the goats on the left, Matthew 25, 33. Yes, yeah, I know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to, I move around a lot. <laughs> okay, alcohol in the Bible. So this was another thing that um, I don't think it's so much of an issue here, but in America, uh, it's a big, a lot of churches, a lot of denominations are very much against alcohol, okay? Very much against wine. I love the vineyards out there. I love, it's just amazing to me. Um, but this was another thing, another experience where I had to be taught um, by living on the homestead, off-grid, where, where I was... I figured out that this thing that I had, this doctrine that I had learned in the churches was wrong. It doesn't make sense. It, it's impractical. It, it's illogical. But I had to put some things into practice before I could learn that. I grew up Baptist. Okay, it's a denomination, Southern Baptist, it's a denomination in uh, America, and it's very, uh, very much against alcohol. Alcohol was not allowed in the denomination, but then I began to grow and harvest fruit. Well, when you grow fruit and you harvest fruit, you want to find a way to preserve it, to keep it, so you have it for future use. Well, the only ways you do that is usually you dry the fruit or you juice the fruit. And if you juice the fruit, you have to figure out a way to save it, make it last. You have to find a preservative. Isaiah 25, 6, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. Anybody ever read that verse before? Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Oh, from my side, yeah. You, know, you guys watch my videos. Amazing verse. I didn't know what the lees were. You know, I read that, I'm like, what are lees? Oh, the dregs. What are dregs? It's the, the, the waste product of the yeast interacting with the sugars of the fruit. When the Father comes back, when Messiah comes, he's going to have a giant banquet. And those Southern Baptists, if they're there in the kingdom, they're going to be drinking alcoholic wine. Verse 9, And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his Yeshua, right, very good, Yeshua. We rejoice in his Yeshua. That's the meal, that's the banquet, that's the marriage supper of the Lamb that the Southern Baptists, at least my denomination and many other denominations, are so anxiously awaiting. We're waiting for that marriage supper of the Lamb, we're taught about that. But do they know that you're gonna be drinking wine during that marriage? <clears throat> 
Yeah, the Lees. The Lees well refined. So uh, my first experience with this was I have these persimmon trees. I have hundreds of them on my property. And I would take these persimmons and I would squish them down and I would add a little bit of water and I would get the flavor out of all the pulp. And then I would add some sugar to it and ferment it. That was the only way you're going to preserve the persimmons. Okay, we, we, we dried some and we canned some for making cookies and other things. But when it comes to the juice, I wanted to save it. And the only way you can do that is with fermentation. The preservative is the alcohol. There's no other way around this. You have to have a preservative. Back then, they didn't have refrigeration. They didn't have any you know, plastic bottles or you know, machinery to vacuum pack the, the packaging. They didn't have any of that. So how did they do it? Alcohol. It's a natural preservative. So this is at a winery in the States, I believe somewhere. And let me just, okay. Um, you put the wine in, you put the yeast in, and you have dregs, lees, that fall to the bottom. It's basically the waste product of the yeast. It falls to the bottom. And then you have some that floats to the top. And in the middle is the wine, and that's what you extract for later use. But a Southern Baptist has never seen that before. <laughs> they just haven't. They just think, you know, juice comes in these nice little bottles from Vineland, New Jersey. Concord grape juice. <clears throat> that white coating on the outside of the grapes is the natural yeast. It's what the father created. He put that there. It happens naturally. If the grape falls from the tree, that yeast, when it cracks the grape as it lands on the ground, will begin to eat at the sugars inside and automatically begin to ferment, making the grapes alcoholic. In my video on alcohol in the Bible, I give a new story. I believe it was, was it in Africa or was it in? Okay. And baboons were coming out of the jungle and they were eating the grapes that had fallen on the ground and they were becoming drunk and they were sleeping inside the vineyard and it was causing problems because there was a bunch of drunk monkeys running around the vineyard. <laughs> <clears throat> It, it, but that shows that this is a natural process that happens naturally, happens quickly. It's a process that the Father put in place. Most fruits will carry their own yeast so that they can be fermented. He's like, I'm giving you a savings plan for you to save your food each and every year. It's already built in. It's like a package. You just got to, you know, do the work to make it. It's done. You don't need any ingredients. Squish it and let it ferment. Then you save it for next year. This is how they did it most of the time. They would use wine skins. They would take the animal, they would tie off the ends, and they would fill it with juice, and they would seal it. And then inside, it would stretch because the carbon di uh, dioxide would, would uh, yeah, dioxide would build and build, and the bubbles would build, and it would stretch the skin to almost the breaking point. And, but it wouldn't break if it was a new skin. And then it would release, and you could open it up, and you could pour out the wine. And you could put it in oak barrels for flavoring or whatever you wanted to do, as long as you kept the air out. You had to keep the air out. <clears throat> Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now my question is, what time of year was this? What, 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 what are we looking at here? What was this? It was the last meal, right? Okay, right before he died. What time of year is that? Springtime. When are the grapes harvested? In the fall. So how do they keep the grapes? How do they keep the juice good that long? Alcohol. They turned it into alcohol. It's the only way you can do it. Back then, at least. Nowadays, with these vineyards, and they have, it's just an exact science, and they have just all kinds of different yeast, and they have secret ingredients that they use with that yeast, and um, very detailed processes to get a perfect wine. Okay, back then, you could still make a perfect wine, but you had to keep the air out, and there was a lot more variables. But it was, it was pretty easy to do. I've done it. I've done it myself. I grew up my whole life being told that wine was our savior, that our savior drank was grape juice. That's what I was told my whole life. Just Concord grape juice. It was only when I moved off-grid without refrigeration that the lights in my head turned on. Grapes are harvested in the fall. Passover is in the spring. How did they keep the juice? It was the alcohol. So this was one we talked about on the way over here. Um, 
hunting in Torah. You know, so this is something I get quite a bit. We do a lot of hunting on our homestead. You know, we, it's how we get a majority of our food. Every fall, right now, I should be out hunting. <laughs> when I get back home, I'm going to be hunting. Okay, and so it's about getting that meat. I'm allowed five deer a year, you know, by the good sheriff of Nottingham. So <laughs> I'm still live on Facebook. Otherwise, I never mind. Um, but uh, yeah, so we harvest deer and we have sheep. And so we'll take the meat that we raise from the sheep and, the, and what we harvest from the deer. And we will put that in our pantry. We raw pack it. We can it and we preserve it. We make a, a, something similar to biltong. Uh, it's called hard salami. That's what we bake in our, in our country. And, um, and we preserve it. It just hangs in my house. And that's our food. And so hunting and Torah, hunting is very important for people out where we live. In fact, it's a big holiday. You take time off. The schools sometimes even close on like the first weekend or week of hunting season because so many of the kids are out in the bush, you know, hunting with their dad. It says, Whatsoever man be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunts and catches any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. Now, this is an important verse because um, as my journey throughout Torah began, I had a number of Orthodox traditional Jews and rabbinical Jews who came to me and said, Zach, you cannot hunt because it has to be rabbinically blessed before you can eat of the meat. It has to be kosher killed. Well, I'm sorry, but the more I study this, I realize that there's nothing in the Bible and nothing in the Torah that describes a kosher kill, okay? That's a man-made tradition that came later. You will find no evidence in your Torah of how to kill an animal specifically, okay? And he told me, some of these told me, that you're not allowed to hunt. You can't hunt because you have to kill the animal with a knife across the throat. It's the, shah the laws of shahita, and you can only do it that way, no other way. But I'm like, what about this verse? It says right there, any children of Israel who hunts and catches an animal. Because if you hunt an animal, it puts adrenaline in the blood and all these things. Nowhere is that in Torah. It's not in Torah. Okay, it's man-made tradition. Okay, it says you can hunt. It says you can catch. Rules are, don't drink the blood. Simple as that. Okay, and there's some fats that you're not allowed to eat. We'll talk about that. I look at hunting differently today than before I lived off grid, okay? Every year around October and November, I start getting the question in my inbox from my emails and uh, through Facebook and other social media. Can I hunt on Shabbat? Because this is my time off. I love spending time in nature and with the Father. It's very relaxing. You know, can I hunt on Shabbat? My answer is no. What, why are they asking that question? The reason they're asking that question is the majority of people live in the cities. They get time off from work. You know, they want to have to, they, they get time off for the weekends. So why don't I just go on a Saturday and I can go hunting? I can kill basically two birds with one stone. I can get my deer and then I don't have to ask off work during the week. Okay. And I say, no, you can't do that. It's work. It's always been work historically throughout antiquity, throughout history. And they don't know that because they don't live in an agrarian-based lifestyle, okay? They probably work in an office somewhere, and Saturday is an easier day to get off work. It's that simple. Everything about hunting is work. Before you go hunting, you plant a bait field. You plant clover. You seed a field, and they, the, the animals come out, and they eat on that field. And so you're there to be able to shoot the animal, to take the harvest the animal because they're coming out for the bait. So it took time to put that bait down. That's something you're doing. That's work. It's not recreation like it is today. People think of it as a sport. It's a sport. It's just fun. You know, I'm just relaxing. No, it's work. When you shoot that deer, now you've got to carry the deer. You try pulling a 110-pound body out of the woods and tell me if you're not sweating by the time you're done. You're sweating. You're not relaxing, you're working. Processing the deer, they've never processed the deer. You know, but our ancient ancestors had to process the deer. You're taking it to a check station and you're gonna drop it off and you're gonna let someone else do it. That's paying somebody to work now. You're now hiring them as your servant and you're paying them to do a job that you can't do. But if you do do it, now you have to process the animal. You have to clean it, you have to field dress it and butcher it, you know, unless you're gonna put it on ice for a certain amount of time. But that's all work. 
But see, people don't realize it's work because to them it's just a sport, it's recreation. They're not living an agrarian-based lifestyle. They're not relying on this as a big portion of their food that their family is going to sustain themselves on. Does that make sense? So how did they hunt back in the day? Has anybody ever seen that movie, um, Last of the Mohicans? You saw Karate Kid, but you didn't see Last of the Mohicans? A couple people. Great movie, Last of the Mohicans, check it out. The opening scene of that movie, they're chasing a, de they're chasing a deer. That's how they used to do it. They would run the deer until the deer started to slow down. You know, either you tired or the, or the deer tired. Or they would basically place a number of hunters in a line and they would use those hunters to move through the woods to force the animals to another set of hunters who were waiting for them. Okay, that's all work. That takes time and effort. And they hunted during the wind and the rain. Some of the best hunts I've been on on my property have been during storms because the deer can't hear you. The deer are very smart. They have good eyes for the most part. They have very good hearing and they have very good nose. Okay, so they, if, they, if they hear you coming, or if they smell you coming, they will run. Okay, but in a rain, a storm, you're getting rid of no, a number of their senses. They can't hear very well because the wind and the rain come, you know, falling on the leaves all around them, it dulls their hearing. And so you can pretty much sneak up on a deer right up next to them before they know you're there, if you do it good enough. And so I've harvested a number of my deer during the wind and the rain and the storms. But that's not a Shabbat. Who wants to do that during a Shabbat? You're wet, you don't feel good, you got water in your shoes. It's not restful, it's work. It's always been work. All right, so here's another example, blood and fat. How you guys doing, you doing all right? Yeah. Okay, we may take a break before, a little, maybe give you a five minute break, we'll see. Yes? Um, I, I've done both, uh, I have a bow. But uh, every time I, sh I live on a mountaintop, and every time I shot the deer, it ran downhill and I had to drag it back up. <laughs> if I shoot it with a rifle, down. <laughs> I don't have to, I, I, I bring the truck and pick them up and go. <laughs> so it's easy. <laughs> um, so blood and fat, this is something else. An amazing window of, of awareness that came over me when I began to butcher my own deer and animals and sheep was the blood and the fat. Many people in this movement had decided to become vegetarians because they don't understand what the scriptures say about blood and fat. I have had a number of people tell me, I'm a vegetarian because I don't want to eat the blood. Okay, It says right here, don't eat the blood. Now, I'm not going to eat the blood. Now, I don't want to eat the fat because there's fat on meat, and we're just not doing it right, and so the meat today all has fat in it. Well, meat's always going to have fat in it. There's a misunderstanding that's happening here. And I'm going to show you today what that is, based on experience, okay? It's good to be cautious. It's good to question Scripture. We don't want to do something that's going to offend our Father. So I'm not saying it's bad on these people who decide to be vegetarians because they don't understand something. I'm just going to avoid it. That's, a, that's actually a pretty good thing to do. You know, it's a very good road to take until you gain more understanding. Leviticus 17.11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Does anyone want to guess what that Hebrew word for life is? Huh? It's the same Hebrew word for soul here. Yes, correct. But what is the Hebrew word? Nefesh. Very good. You guys get, you guys get brownie points. Nefesh. Nefesh. It's the same word, interchanged for souls and life. Amazing Hebrew word. Check it out. Learn it. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath, nefesh, and man became a living nefesh, soul. Interchangeably, used interchangeably, life and soul in your English translations, my English translations. I don't know. Um, I've seen some amazing, the uh, Afrikan. Bibles, you guys are showing me amazing translations that are just beautiful. Um, I don't know what they say, but I'm going by the American translation, the English. Same word used interchangeably, nefesh. Genesis 2 7. Oh. 
Another verse, Deuteronomy 12, 23. Only be sure that you eat of the blood, eat not of the blood, for the blood is the life, the nefesh, and you mayest not eat the nefesh with the flesh, the life with the flesh. <clears throat> People still do this today. They drink blood. Okay, they basically take the, the coagulated blood out of the neck of an animal and they drink it. In America, how many of you guys saw the movie um, Wolverines? What is that? What? Actually, no, 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 that, that's not Wolverine, but no, the guys who were, Red Dawn. Red Dawn, that's right, how many of you seen Red Dawn? Remember the hunting scene in that movie, where they, they shot, the, the kid shot his first deer, and they made him drink the blood of an animal, that's a, that's a tradition that's very widely held in America, you, shoot, you, you drink the blood, I've never done it, thank goodness, but it's, it's done often, and they say you take on the life of the animal, in the movie they said that, the nefesh, God says not to do that. There are some traditions that state you need to cook your meat enough to remove all the blood. There's salt rinsing methods, things like that that people say you need to do. None of that is in Torah. It's not in Torah. None of it's in Scripture. In fact, nothing about cooking is in your Bible at all except for Passover. It's the one time it's in there when it comes to meat. There are literally two types of blood in your body and in the bodies of animals. How many of you knew that? Two types of blood. One carries life, the other does not. Amazing. I had no idea about this. And I, and I should have known, you know, when you butcher an animal, there are two types of blood. You know, one is very distinct. One coagulates the instant it hits oxygen. That's the life. That carries the nefesh. You have hemoglobin, which is over there, and you have myoglobin, which is right here. Hemoglobin and myoglobin. This is part of the Father's creation. Only one carries life. Only one carries the oxygen to the body to be used. It's the hemoglobin. The other one does not do that. The hemoglobin carries life. And when you butcher an animal, you can recognize it instantly because when it falls upon the ground, it coagulates. It becomes like a, 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 a tough... Right. So it's easy to recognize. What pours out on the ground during the slaughter of an animal is the hemoglobin. How many times do we hear about the blood being poured out? That's the blood you don't eat or drink. It's that coagulated blood. That's the blood that carries the life. The blood that carries life, nefesh. You will never fully get rid of all traces of myoglobin from the flesh of an animal. It's impossible. I don't care how much you cook it. You can cook it till it's charcoal. There's still gonna be myoglobin in that charcoal. It's going to, you're never going to get rid of it. It can't be taken out. It's impossible. No matter how much you salt it, no matter how much you soak it in water, you're still going to have myoglobin in that meat. But it's not hemoglobin. It's not the blood that carries life, that carries the nefesh. Only you shall not eat the blood thereof. You shall pour it upon the ground as water. This is the, 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 the hemoglobin. So does everyone understand that? Hemoglobin, myoglobin. One carries life. Okay, you can have your steaks medium rare or medium, you know, that, that pink that you see inside the meat is not hemoglobin. You ever hear about a guy um, or a person, any, anyone who has a very tragic automobile accident? And a lot of times when they die, it's because of the liver cannot, uh, it goes into a renal failure because the liver cannot process the myoglobin. When the myoglobin mixes with the hemoglobin in your body, you die, because your, your liver can't handle that. And so you hear about people who are in tragic accidents, or they fall, or something like that, and it's because their muscles have been so torn up that the myoglobin in the muscles has gotten into their bloodstream, and the liver can't handle it, and it can't process the myoglobin, and so they die of renal failure. That tells you right there that they're two different substances. What about the fat? This is something else that comes up quite a bit. I can't eat this, it's got fat on it. God says not to eat the fat. It's not the same fat. I'm gonna show you that today. People get really nervous when they see um, over and over in scripture to not eat the fat. There's lots of Facebook debates on this. I can't eat the fat. It shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you eat neither fat nor blood. Leviticus 3, 17. 
And you shall take all the fat that covers the inwards and all the caul that is above the liver and all the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them and burn them upon the altar. Okay, this is not the fat in the meat, folks. This is inside the body cavity. So when you butcher an animal, there's amazing amounts of fat inside the, the, the body cavity that surrounds some of the internal organs. This fat is a very pure fat. It's like, I don't know, do you guys have Crisco here? Okay, it, it's like a, a lard or something that you, you know, it's like a, it usually comes in a, in a can, and it's like you can scoop it, it's like very mush. It's like the perfect pure fat. Okay, it's been rendered almost already. You don't even need to render it if you don't want to. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, You shall eat no manner of fat, or of ox, or of sheep, or of goat, and the fat of the beast that dies of itself, and the fat that which is torn with beast may be used in any other use, but you shall in no wise eat of it. And he shall offer it all the fat thereof, the rump and the fat that covers the inwards, so rump and inwards, and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them, which, they, which is by the flanks and the call that is above the liver, with the kidneys it shall he, it shall he take away. Okay. This is, it's called the oriental sheep. And this, this sheep has a very large tail, which was built mostly with fat. And it was on the rump as well. You have this one here. This is another sheep, just like that. You don't, you don't see a lot of sheep like that today. But there's, a, there's a, a variation within sheep breeds. One is a heritage breed, and one is a commercial breed. The ones that we have today were, have been modernized with different genetics, you know, hand breeding uh, to produce more meat and to produce more wool. But the heritage breed sheep were the original sheep that uh, most ancient herders would, would raise, and this is one of those heritage breeds. This is what they would have had a long time ago. And there's some heritage breeds today that are still intact that shepherds still raise. Okay, they haven't been commercialized. Okay, this is one of those. It's the fat on the rump. And this is one of the, that's why it says that in the scripture. This is one of the fats you take away and you burn it. Okay, you're not to eat of it. And he shall offer of it of the fat thereof, the rump and the fat that covers the inwards. So you have the fat on the butt, on the rump of this, like the sheep, and the inwards. This is the ones you take away. And you really don't know the difference until you actually slaughter an animal yourself and see for yourself what fats those are. Does that make sense? Learn by doing. Wax on, wax off. Paint the fence. You learn by doing. So here's the breakdown, okay? When it comes to fats. Use inward fats of non-sacrificial animals. You can use these. They would use these for like wagon wheel grease or uh, candle making, things like that. Okay to use those. Don't eat it, it says. Use for candles, bowstrings, etc. Um, the prohibited fats are the inward fats of sacrificial animals. So if an animal was perfect, okay, it was going to be a sacrificial animal, it was going to go to the temple and be used for that purpose, or if it was going to be used for any type of offering that a family would bring to the altar, those fats get burned. Make sense? You don't use those for candles. You don't use those for bowstrings or wagon wheel, you know, grease. Those get burned. Make sense? We as a culture in the last hundred plus years have largely forgotten the anatomy of our livestock. That's because we don't take our animals apart anymore. We let someone else do that for us. We let machines do it for us. You know, the machines do it. We don't have to see it. It's an unpleasant sight. And so I let them do it. All I do is go to the store and buy it in these nice little packages. You know, put them on my, my pot and pan or in the, is it the braai? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we call it barbecue. But I don't have to see any of that. They do it for me. So we're disconnected. We don't understand these things. Bible things and Bible ways, right? Wax on, wax off. So when the Bible describes the fats not to eat, we are clueless. We don't know. And so when someone discovers Torah, they're new to Torah, they come in and they're like, don't eat the fat. And they look at their steak. I can't eat that. It's got fat on it. It says right there, do not eat the fat because they're disconnected. You see what all that does? We've lost our way. No wonder the father is going to have to bring us out into the wilderness once again. He's got to get us on the same page. He's got to be like, hey, listen. We got a whole bunch of learning we got to redo over again. We're just like they were in Egypt. We're surrounded by so much sin. 
We're surrounded by so much pagan, pagan idolatry and pagan ways. We have forgotten the ways of our father. We don't know how to be a Hebrew people anymore. So we're going to talk about the greater Exodus today. When the Bible describes the blood to pour out, we don't understand that either. The blood that carries life. Myoglobin versus hemoglobin. Most people have never seen the difference. They didn't know there was a difference. You, know, you can also tell the difference between a very bright red blood and a very dark red blood. It has two different colors, actually. It's both red. That's the only similarity. But their entire genetic makeup is completely different. Completely different. This is the fats. This is an example of the fats. This is taken from a sheep. Does anybody know what this is? Good job. That's great. How do you know that? Huh? You hunt. Oh, well, no, everybody said it. It was good. That's good. Yeah, it's a kidney. Very, you all get gold stars today. No, that's the kidney, and it's surrounded by the fat, and this fat is a very Crisco-y, pure type fat. You know, it's very soft. Yeah, you don't have to render this. You could almost use it as is. People still render it, but it's perfect. This is the, this is the fat the father's talking about. And when you work it, you pull it out, there's the kidney. It just pops out, pops open. It's crap. And keeps its shape. That's the fat it says not to eat. In a cow, it's called the suet. You ever heard of, I mean, they say that here, suet? On a pig, it's called the leaf lard. Anybody ever heard of leaf lard? Yeah, well. <laughs> well, some of us used to. It's, it's. <laughs> Oh, boy. You're going to be in trouble before the weekend's over. Um, yeah, leaf lard. On a pig, on a cow, it's called the suet. Okay, I don't know what it's called on a sheep or a goat, but same thing. Fats. The fat that Scripture mentions is a very pure fat. Suet is cow, and we have leaf lard on a pig. It's body cavity fats is what it comes down to. Make sense? The fat's inside the body cavity and the rump. Okay. Vegetarians. You know, I like vegetarians. Where's she at? She... It's okay to be vegetarian. It's totally fine to be a vegetarian. You know, and I understand because here's the deal. If I couldn't raise my own meat, I wouldn't be so easy about buying meat at the store. You know, you can find good meat, good butchers. Like you have Whole Foods here at my place and you have um, uh, grass-fed farmers that, that place you to, you know, they have that stuff. And that's where you search out and you can find good meats for that way. But... Um, you know, but the issue is when we're new to Torah and we say you shouldn't eat meat because the fat in the blood, it's just being unknowledgeable about the topic. Does that make sense? Okay. But Daniel purposed in his heart. We're going to go through this one, too, because this comes off a lot. I get a lot of emails on this. I've done videos on it. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And so people will come to me and say, right here, Daniel said he wanted to do it. It's called the Daniel fast. Anybody ever heard of this? Yeah, the Daniel fast. This is one of the fasts that we do when we come to Torah to cleanse ourselves, right? So right there, Daniel doesn't defile himself with the king's meat. He eats vegetables. Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let us give them us vegetables to eat and water to drink. See, he just eats veggies and water. And he looks so much more healthy. You know, that's what we should be doing. They'll say that. They'll say we should be doing that. The reason Daniel and the others looked better and more healthy is not because he was eating only veggies. It was because Daniel and the Hebrews were eating veggies and the other kids were eating garbage. They were defiling themselves. They were probably eating pork or who knows whatever. You know, so he was like, I'm not eating that. I'm not going to defile myself. Just give us vegetables. The kids were eating all the lizards and everything else, whatever it was. Let them eat that. And then you compare us in 10 days and you tell me which looks better. I'll take that challenge any day of the week. Because the kids who are eating the vegetables are going to look better. Because the other kids are just eating garbage. They're eating th what the father says is not food. So um, this is a great book. It's called For the Love of Wine. And it says, almost all the wineskin I have seen, uh, this is the professor Stephen Estreicher, are from a pig or sheep or a goat. Remember we talked about how wine was made? It's made with these, pig, these skins. 
animal skins. A lot of them are made from pig skins. So remember Daniel, he says, I'm not eating, drinking the, the, the meat, eating the meat or drinking the wine. Probably because he knew how the wine was made. Now, I don't know about you. I'm just thinking. I'm just guessing that maybe wine made in a pig skin is not kosher. <laughs> right? I'm not eating. I'm not drinking that. But that's how, if they made it that way, and a lot of them were, history tells us they were, then no one's going to drink that wine. Not, not one who knows better, because there's no way that's healthy for you. And so I'm not eating the king's meat. I'm not drinking the king's wine. And after 10 days, you judge and see who looks better. Kids eating the, the piggy wine or me? I'll drink water. <clears throat> all right. So everyone having a good time so far? Everybody all right? All right. So now we're going to talk about the importance of family. Okay. We're going to talk about what has been revealed to me on, with this based on family and a Torah <clears throat> agricultural lifestyle. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to get a drink of water. <clears throat> because some of the best revelations that I've had are about my family when living this lifestyle. Based on the differences we live in America today, this is some of the most important things for me, was the importance of an agrarian-based lifestyle and the effect on the family. <clears throat> the importance of a family takes on new meaning when you return to an agrarian lifestyle. What have families looked like for the last 40 plus years? 40 plus years. Now, this is how I view it from an American standpoint. It may be different for you guys. But number one, a man marries a woman. Okay, begins the family. The kids, they raise them up, they send them to public schools. Okay? The kids go to college. They graduate from public schools, they go off to college. Kids leave home. Kids leave home and they go off and they start their own careers and they eventually marry and start a family. Mom and dad get old, and the kids put parents in the nursing home, and then they die. Isn't that, I mean, I don't know about you, but in America, that's basically how it works. I mean, is it close to the same? Right, right okay. Same thing. That's the modern world we live in in the West. In my father's house, John 14, 2 says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prayer, prepare a place for you. I prepare a place for you. It where? In his father's house. Now, this is telling. We're going to dig deeper into this, but this is very telling. In an agrarian lifestyle, having your male children remain with you was essential to the survival of the family. It was key, and you see it all throughout the Torah. Over and over. I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house, John 14, 2. Who are we? We're the bride. He's taking her, his bride back to his father's house. That's important. That was how it was done. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the sons, Jacob's sons, the tribes, it's all how they did it. The sons stayed with Jacob, did they not? You didn't hear about him going off somewhere else. They maintained Jacob's herds. They built on the family business that was started by Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob. And now his sons are building on that business. And they were wealthy because they stuck around and they built on that business. Sons maintain the inheritance of the father and then they pass it on. You see it over and over again in Scripture. There was no other way. It's how you built the inheritance of the family. It's how you built the wealth of a family. In an agrarian lifestyle, having a hierarchy established was essential to the survival of a family. Blessings of the father to the sons. This maintained order in the family. And fathers, I can't tell you how important it is for you to sit down with your sons on Shabbat. Next Shabbat, next week, sit down with your sons and give them a blessing. You know, put your hands on their head and bless them and do it every week. I've heard time and time again where people bring up studies on the Jews and they wonder why Jews are so successful in this world today. They become owners of companies and they have successful companies. Well, it's pretty easy to do from the time you were born until the time you left home, your father is coming to you and blessing you and tell you how, how good of a child, how blessed you are of a child, how blessed you are of God and that God will watch over and protect you and, and, and always allow you to possess the gates of his enemies, of your enemies. 
That builds a confidence in a child. You know, and that's a good tradition. It's not something commanded in scripture. But it says, we were talking about this this week, where it says, dedicate a child in the way, or I'm sorry, train up a child in the way that it should go. Psalms, uh, Proverbs 22. It's dedicate, it's Hanak, the word Hanak, Hanukkah, where we get Hanukkah from. Dedicate a child in the way that he should go. What is a father doing? Every Shabbat, he's putting his hands on that, boy, on that son's head, and he's dedicating that child in the way that he should go. That he would be obedient to the Father's commandments and seek his commandments and guard his commandments. And that he would be blessed for it. May you always possess the gates of your enemies. May you have a wife who loves the Father and who loves Yeshua and would seek after obedience in your family. But when you do that from birth on up, it's no wonder you're successful. We need to be doing that as a people. We need to take that cue from them. It's the same thing. It's maintain, maintenance. I'm maintaining the order of my family, maintaining its success. As Hebrews, we need to train up our children with the idea that they're going to remain at home. My sons, we have 56 acres on our property. They know, they already have their house sites picked up. One of them's 10, or I'm sorry, one of them's 11, one of them's five. They know where their houses are going to be already. They, I've told them this. They, I'm training them up this way. You're going to build a house here. This is where you and your wife will live one day. You're going, to build, you're going to build a house here. This is where you and your wife will live one day. And they're going to be debt free because the land's paid off. They don't have to worry about that. Now, what happens in America today or maybe in your culture? They go to college. They put mom and dad. They sell the land. You know, mom and dad are too old to take care of it. They sell the land. They take the money and they go buy a new car. And they, go, you know, and they buy a house at the bank with a loan. They go into debt. And they're in debt their whole lives. And eventually the inheritance they get from mom and dad are gone. And then their kids raise up. And whatever they've accumulated, the kids eventually sell. And it's just, it's squandered. It all goes back to the government or it gets sold and squandered on toys and things we don't need. Does it make, I mean, you see the difference, right? That's important. If the father's going to raise up a nation, this is how you do it. You raise up a nation to be prosperous. So that the world around you looks at you and says, why are you so successful? Great, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you why I'm successful. Because the Father has blessed me, because I obey. It's that simple. The importance of men staying at home with their father, it was the survival of the family. That was what was at stake. The heartache of Isaac. Remember the heartache of Isaac for Esau? Him and Rebekah, when he chose a wife? Two times it's mentioned. It was a grievous to their heart. Because I, you're marrying the women of Canaan. We can't have this in our family. They're going to draw you away. You know, they're going to draw you away from what's important and from obedience into these pagan gods. And it was a burden to them. That's one of the reasons I think, you know, people always talk about Isaac. You know, was he blind? He was near, he says, I'm near death. No, he wasn't near death. I mean, you go on, he lives for like another seven chapters. He, he, he was disappointed in his firstborn for being dis, for disobeying mom and dad, you know? And so he gave the birthright to the son who was obedient. Rebecca didn't want, I mean, Rebecca had already been told by God that this was going to happen. She knew ahead of time, and they discussed it, and they saw the actions of their older son, and it displeased them. You know, he wasn't, he, he this, in my opinion, this was all uh, a way to bypass the drama that would be if, you know, by saying, I'm sorry, son, you don't deserve it, you know. And they sent the son away. He came back. All was good. The importance of men finding a proper wife. Fathers, train up your children now to do so, okay. You know, in fact, it, it, you know, people frown on arranged marriages heavily in my country. But this is how it used to be done, you know. And it's not that... My, my kids and, and the girl wouldn't have veto power of what their parents are trying to arrange for them. They do, of course. But why would you make the most important decision in your life and not have the people who love you the most in life be a part of it and help you in that decision? It's going to affect you and your family for generations. One bad decision like that. And we've seen these decisions, these poor decisions made by other people in our lives, you know, by ourselves sometimes. You know, the effect on that. 
And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Berai the Hittite, and Bashemoth, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were a grief of mine unto Isaac and Rebekah. It's my personal opinion that the Hittites were not entirely intact when it came to human genetics. And that's why it grieved him in the heart so much. If you go look back and you look at ancient Hittite writings and monuments, they're half animal and they're half human. Was that the case? I don't know. Elon the Hittite that Abraham bought the field from, or uh, Ephron the Hittite, his, his name means animal-like or fawn-like. It's interesting. But you understand why it grieved Isaac and Rebekah that their son was making these poor choices. <clears throat> Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one. People say, well, Zach, what about this verse right here? They, the, they shall leave the father and mother. Well, yeah, I understand that, but understand that this is tough for a time. This is about a, a, a union. This is not about actually leaving the house, leaving the land, you know, leaving them to go out on their own. You have this verse, verses 28, 21, 20 and 21. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and I will keep and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on that I come again to my father's house in peace. The goal was to come back home. Because this is where I was supposed to be. This is where he was supposed to be. Back home in my father's house. Males staying among the father's house was essential for an agrarian lifestyle. It was the retirement plan, if you will. Okay? Understanding this concept will make the importance of some of the actions that take place in Scripture much more relevant. Sons were the father's and mother's retirement plan. They would stay with the land and be your caregivers in your old age. They would carry on the family business and build on what was already built by the father. Where I live in rural Arkansas, there are a lot of aging landowners. And this is, I mean, it's, I think it's part of the father's plan that he's making this land available to us. Why? Because these people are getting old. Their kids moved out a whole long time ago. They're living in the cities and they're just waiting for mom and dad to fall over dead. Woohoo! I got cash now because I can sell that land and take it and have a fun time. Because I'm not living out there. They don't even have cell service out there. Why would I move out there? You know, there's no malls. There's no Walmart. You know, I got to drive 30 minutes to go to Walmart. I'm not doing that. I got a Walmart around the corner or whatever. Whole Foods or... I'm not doing that. I'm not going to live like that. Mom and dad are crazy. You know, so as soon as they get a chance, they put mom and dad in a home or they sell off the land when mom and dad pass away and it's gone. And people like me are buying it up. Thank you. Because we'll take it. I see the value in it. And it's because they didn't raise their children. They didn't dedicate their children in the way they should go. Most of these people are good Christian people. They have good values. They know it's wrong to murder, to steal, commit adultery. They're good people. They try, they're trying their best to live the way the Bible says, but they're missing it. We as a people, this movement that you see springing up from almost everywhere is going to change things. Multiple sons were not an issue. One was given to be the heir, usually the firstborn. It was the firstborn's responsibility to lead the family and maintain its stability. That's important. You as the firstborn, how many firstborns we got here? Firstborn males? Just, a, just two, three? Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's your responsibility to maintain the order of the family. You're the leader. Once dad passes away, that falls to you. That's your responsibility. <clears throat> maintain the stability among the siblings and their offspring. Patriarchs and matriarchs. That falls to them. It says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until rest, Shiloh, rest, comes. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Okay? This is twofold. You can take this as prophetic, which I believe it is, talking about our Messiah. Shiloh means rest. Okay? The scepter from Judah will not depart. What does that mean? Who holds the scepter? The king does. The king holds the scepter. He's in charge. Who's king of the family? Judah. From here on out. And that's the way it's always been. The line of Judah. He holds the scepter. He was telling his family, he's the boss when I'm gone. Who is it supposed to go to? Why did he lose, his, why did he lose that position? Poor decision-making. 
Moreover, I, Jacob, have given thee, Joseph, one portion above thy brethren. So he split it. Okay, he gave it to Ephraim, basically, Joseph. Joseph, you get the double portion. It usually went to Judah because now that Judah has the scepter, the double portion would go to that firstborn who had the scepter so that he had the wealth to be able to maintain the stability of the family. However, Jacob does it different. He loves Joseph. And so he gives him a double portion amongst you know, his brothers. You get the double portion inheritance. Judah, you get the scepter. You're in charge. But I love Joseph. I'm giving him the double portion. And so you see, these two tribes are the largest in Israel. They become the northern house, the house of Judah, you know, the southern house, and then the, the northern house, the house of Israel, also sometimes called the house of uh, Joseph or house of Ephraim. So they take on that name. So you have two houses, north and south. We're going to talk more about this later. <clears throat> what is a sacrifice? I mean, everyone understand any questions about family? We'll, get, we'll do a little bit of question and answer after I'm done with this, but... We're going to talk about what is a sacrifice now. One of the ways that greatly expanded my understanding of sacrifices and my Messiah was my move to raise livestock. Amazing revelations came from this. I'm going to give you some examples here today. It says, 1 John 2, 2, He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. Atones. One of the biggest arguments by the anti-missionaries, you have seen me probably take on some of the anti-missionaries lately. I'm going to continue that fight. It's an easy fight to win because they're so wrong. <laughs> um, the issue is not the Messiah. One of the biggest arguments they make is the argument that human sacrifice is not permitted in the Torah. This is absolutely incorrect. And I can show you multiple examples. In fact, I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag. But there is a sacrifice that occurs in your Bible that no one ever talks about. And it's a human sacrifice. I'm not going to go over it with you today, but just stay tuned. We will say, they will say that a man cannot atone for man. That's incorrect. I'll prove it in Scripture. This is false. Numbers 25, 10, verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. I was going to consume the children of Israel, he says. Wherefore, say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and he shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God, and he made an atonement for the children of Israel. How did he make an atonement? He killed two people. He killed two people. And the father saw it as atonement for the children of Israel. The death of the unrighteous for the righteous. When our Messiah died on that cross, he took our unrighteousness. He became the unrighteous for the future righteous. Make sense? He killed two people. That word atonement, by the way, is the same Hebrew word for atonement that you will find in all of Leviticus when it talks about the sacrifices to make atonement for the sins of Israel. Same Hebrew word. <clears throat> two others died for the benefit of others. Amazing. Two people who became sin for us. You in thy mercy has led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. You has guided them in thy strength into thy holy habitation. This is Exodus 15, 13. <clears throat> it says right here that the people of Egypt were redeemed. How were they redeemed? redeemed? What just happened? We're at Exodus 15. A whole bunch of Egypt just died that day. He killed a whole bunch of firstborn, and the whole land cried out in their anguish. And he calls them that came out redeemed because of death of others. You're telling me that someone can't die for another? I'm telling you absolutely they can't. Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. So someone was wounded for someone else's transgressions. Now, the anti-missionaries are going to tell you, well, this is the nation of Israel. This is Israel. Israel was wounded for Israel's transgressions. It doesn't make sense. It says he 
It doesn't say they were wounded for their transgressions. So they're saying that <clears throat> in 1940 Germany, when Jews were taken from their homes and put into ovens, it was their wounds that were for the transgressions of the other part of Israel. That was the sacrifice. No, I'm sorry, that doesn't work. It says he was wounded for our, singular versus plural. Makes sense? He was bruised for our iniquities. That's someone being bruised for someone else's iniquities. That's amazing. I mean, we're talking example after example. This is all in Isaiah 53. With his stripes, we are healed. So someone's whipped, and because he's whipped, I'm healed. Someone else is healed. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He stricken, not us. I made the transgression, someone made the transgression, and because of that transgression, someone else is stricken. When you shall make his soul an offering for sin. Now that's a big one. Now we're talking about offerings. We're talking about sacrifices. An offering, that's what an offering is. His soul an offering for sin. He shall bear their iniquities, bearing someone else's iniquities. And he bears the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Intercession, someone dying for another. Amazing and brilliant and poetic and beautiful. That's amazing. Numbers 30, 35 is all about atonement. Let's see, what am I going on time? Okay. Got a little bit, all right. Oh, we'll, we'll, we got too much longer. We'll do a little bit of question and answer and then we'll wrap it up. Number 35 is all about atonement. Does anybody know what about number 35 is about? It's an amazing picture. So you have this high priest and he sits as the high priest and then you have a slayer, someone who kills somebody unintentionally. But see, anytime blood is spilt on the land, there has to be an account for it. Blood doesn't get spilt in the Holy Land of Israel and there not be an account for it. Something has to happen. So you kill somebody unintentionally. You're out there working and the ax head flies off and hits a guy in the head and boom, he goes down and he's dead. And the slayer demands blood. You know? And so you go to a city of refuge okay, and you wait there. It was not intentional. You didn't murder the person, but he still died. And so something has, there has to be a, a, a transaction to make good on that blood that hit the land. That's, that was spilled on the soil. And so you stay there until when? The high priest dies. And then guess what? You're free to go. You now have freedom because of what you've done. Even though it was unintentional, blood was spilled on the land. Account has to be made for that. And the high priest dies. The death of the righteous for the unrighteous. See, it goes either way. The death of the unrighteous for the righteous and the death of the righteous for the unrighteous. You see both in our Messiah, because he was righteous, yet he became unrighteousness for us. It's all about atonement. It's all about a shadow picture. How can you not see that? The death of a high priest for someone who even sins unintentionally. See, there's no repentance, you know, for someone who willingly is rebellious, you know. I mean, he can, someone can always make that choice. But if you willingly, openly defy the Father, and you don't care, but see, for this person, it was unintentional. And he seeks forgiveness. And the death of the high priest gave him that forgiveness and allowed him to be free. The death of the high priest, the atoning death of the righteous. Clear contrast. Phinehas, the death of the unrighteous for the righteous. The slayer, the death of the righteous for the unrighteous. See the difference. Both are shadow pictures of our Messiah. Both are symbols of atonement for another. Amazing. What is a sacrifice? Now, this is something different. This is something also that opened up a whole new world to me when I began to live an off-grid lifestyle. And I'll give you some examples. They're fun examples. So the question I must first ask is, what is animal husbandry? Do you know, anyone know what animal husbandry is? Few people. Okay. Animal husbandry. Animal husbandry, this is the correct definition, animal husbandry is the management and care of farm animals by humans in which genetic qualities and behavior considered to be advantageous to humans are further developed. Now what that's saying is, when you have a good animal, you wanna keep that animal, 
you make sure that animal is the breeding stock for your other animals, future animals down the road. Make sense? It's like when you get a beautiful plant that makes big, bright, giant tomatoes, you save the seeds from that plant. You don't save the seeds from the wilted plant that's putting out little tiny tomatoes. No, you get the best plant. And you take that and you save the seeds from that plant. Same with the animals. You get a nice sheep that's perfect, you make sure that's your next breeding stock. Or you save the ewes that have the best breeding qualities, and the ewes, these are female sheep, you take those out and you slaughter those. And you keep only the good ewes to be your next breeding stock. Okay? If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him, let him offer a male without blemish. Without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And if his oblation be of a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it to the herd, whether it be of a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. See, offerings, that's the one thing they all have in common. They're all without blemish. All throughout your scripture, in fact, Leviticus chapter 1, they say the Jews in their oral tradition say that's a separate sacrifice. It's not. It, we're starting the sacrifices. The Father's giving us all the sacrifice information, all the offering information. He starts off with the very most important thing. It must be without blemish. That's, Le that's what Leviticus 1 is all about, without blemish. And then he continues to remind us, as we go through all the other scriptures, the offerings without blemish, without blemish. It's an important aspect. And it's all, you know, no wonder it makes him so angry later on down the road when his people are bringing him offerings that are blemish. The blind, the lame. These are animals that no one would want to put on an altar, not much less breed. You don't want to bring you, keep those genetics inside your herd. What did without blemish actually mean? Everyone who owned a herd of animals strived to have the best herd possible. Why? Because that's the most money to be made. Simple. You have a good herd, it brings you good money, brings you good income. This was your family business. Make sense? It was a sacrifice on my part as a farmer to give up the best of my herd. So, in American Homestead, you'll see a couple videos in our season episodes of us going to the county fair. Has anybody seen these? Going to the county fair? We go to the county fair and I bring some of our sheep. And I, I see the judging of the other sheep. And I, they, they're grading them on all of these things I have never heard about before. The judge is up there and he's talking in this language. He's speaking English, but I don't understand a word he's saying. Because he's talking about the volume of a sheep. <laughs> Sounds okay to me. The balance of a sheep. Yeah, he's standing on all fours. He's not falling over. He seems pretty good balance. Structure, etc. There's so many things he was talking about on judging the sheep. I had no idea what he's talking about. He's, ta he's seeing blemishes and all of these sheep. All of them had blemishes and he was pointing them out. You know, most of these herds, people uh, bring the herds. They have small herds, maybe, you know, at, at the most 50 to 60, 70 animals. Okay, and they're picking out from the herds the perfect, you know, best ones that they know how to pick. And the judge is telling them which ones are good, which ones are not, and uh, picking out all the blemishes to the crowd. And I just, I'm beside myself learning this, and I'm like, I don't understand any of this. I have a lot to learn. But then it dawned on me, after the fair was over, I go back home, and I read my Bible, and we go back to Torah portions, and it talks about without blemish. Here was this judge showing you how easy it is to identify the blemishes, but I can't see it because I don't know it. Make sense? Because I'm disconnected from that. You know, I would love to sit down and have a conversation with Yeshua. But the very next person besides him, I would love to sit down and have a conversation with is Jacob. Because that guy knew sheep. I mean, he, he knew sheep. I mean, what did he like basically took Laban for a ride and, I mean, he, he got the best of the herd just by doing animal husbandry. He put the, the poplar branches. I don't know how it's translated in Afrikaans, but it's the branches, this wood. And wood is often a medicinal. Like in my, in my country, they put walnut, black walnut hulls in the water to help get rid of parasites of your animals. There's all kinds of tricks, you know. And he was putting these branches in their water to give them an aphrodisiac for certain animals so that they would breed and keep the genetics, the animal husbandry in, in the flock that he wanted. He was brilliant. And we've lost all that. We have no idea what that's talking about. I would love to know what that branch is. 
but it's all been lost to us. You know, and we can learn this again as a people. You know, if we search out the answers, you know, we live in a world today, we'll talk more about that with the greater exodus. We live in a world today where information is being shared like this. Some of these, these knowledges that have been lost, people find old manuscripts and text and papyruses and, and they translate them and they put them online and new knowledge is gained. Maybe somewhere out there, someone who knew the secrets of Jacob will share that with the internet, the world, and his people can once again learn these things that have been lost. Volume, balance, and structure, I had no idea what any of this meant. And so I went home and I began to learn. And I began to learn what a blemish was. And I realized that all of my sheep had blemishes. You know, not one that was perfect. And so I, ended up, I actually ended up getting a whole new flock and uh, starting over. And that's what we're starting with now. We have a number of um, St. Croix. They're from the Caribbean. They're a Caribbean breed. And um, they're a very heritage breed. And they're very resistant to pests and, and parasites and things like that. I've learned. And so I'm starting new. You know, with what I've learned, and, and so far it's doing it's doing well. I haven't had to give them any medicines. The other flock, I had to like give them medicines constantly, and they were still dying on me. <laughs> but I didn't know, you know. And so I'm learning. When I learned about the importance of animal husbandry, the instructions for the sacrifices took on new meaning, totally new meaning. The lives of the shepherd and his family are at stake. He had to make sure to keep the very best for the future of his herd. When you have that animal that's born and he has the right volume, he has the right structure and balance, you set that lamb aside. You set him aside from the herd because you don't want, I mean, rams fight, the males fight, and you don't want him to get scarred up. You don't want him to injure himself, uh, hurt a hip or whatever. So you set him aside and you make sure he's going to be the heir for the following year. And the ewes, you keep the ewes, unless they're really bad or something, but you keep the ewes. And the males, all the males that are born, what happens to them? Food, the food, they get eaten. We don't keep the best for ourselves, we give the best to him. <clears throat> and that's what I learned out of this. You see, it, it behooves me to take that one, I set it, and I put it aside for my future herd, but you know what? It doesn't belong to me, because he says it belongs to him. So it's a sacrifice on my part to take that animal and put it on an altar and kill it before our creator. It was giving up the very best. And he says, aha, see, my kids love me because they'll give me their very best. That was the whole thing with Isaac and Abraham. He was going to give him his best. This was my son. I'm going to give him my best. You sure? It's deep, it's, do you see the deeper meaning that happens that takes place once you begin to walk out this lifestyle? You read your scriptures with a new understanding. If his offering be a burnt, offer, a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. See, it takes my own voluntary will to bring that perfect animal to be given before the Father. That says something about a person. It says something about his heart. Who was without blemish? Yeshua. Yeshua. It's a death, again, of the righteous for the unrighteous. Numbers 35. You know, there's a lot of people, I don't care what you say, they're not going to believe. There's a lot of anti-missionaries out there. And today, I've made this point over and over again, where you have people telling you on this side, the commandments don't matter. They're telling you to pick and choose which commandments you want to follow. And then you have people on this side who are telling you the Shua is all fake. There is no Messiah. And um, they're either falling back to Judaism or falling away from belief in God altogether. See, that's the patience of the saints. Who will believe? Who will endure? I love this verse. John 20, 27, 28 says, Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither by, thing, by finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither by hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Yeshua saith, saith unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. Just closing prayer. Abba, Father, we just thank you again for this conference, this beautiful day. And uh, Father, we see the clouds gathering outside, and we just pray and know you're going to bring your rain upon your people. And so, Father, we just lift you up. We glorify you. We're so happy to be here and to learn, and we ask that your wisdom of your word be imparted to each of us today. I ask you to continue to bless the conference and the speakers who are coming. 
We ask all this in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Does anybody have any questions real quick on just American homestead or agricultural base? We'll do some other stuff on Greater Exodus, but does anybody have any questions? We, we can wait till the end. It's up to you, but... If I can't find kosher meat. There is none. So um, what we did back in St. Louis in Missouri and before we moved off grid is we searched out people who were raising the animals themselves. And a lot of times the farmers, I don't know what rules you have here, but a lot of times there the farmers will sell the meat directly to the consumers at the farm. So if you don't want to go to the store and buy kosher meat, that's marked kosher, that's fine. You can maybe search out a farmer. But understand this, just because it's not labeled kosher, to get that label kosher on the package, they have, yes, it has to be, it has to have a rabbi bless it. Um, for instance, my mother-in-law who lives with us on the homestead, she used to work for Pilgrim's Pride Chickens and Turkeys in Texas. And every week they would have a guy, a rabbi come in, and they would have an um, uh, imam come in, and they would bless the factory. And that allowed them to put the kosher symbol on their packages. And they would send a bill. All he did was come in there and say a prayer once a month, and then that allowed them to mark kosher on it. To me, eh, that's kind of a racket. I'm in the wrong business. You know, so it's like, is it really kosher? If it comes from a clean animal, I think you're okay. Now, the quality of the meat might not be okay because they're feeding our animals today a bunch of junk, at least in my country they are. And I'm not really comfortable eating all that, at least not too often. But uh, my, your best bet is to search out a farmer who you know they grass feed their animals and make a deal with that farmer and purchase directly from the farm. Yes, sir? Um, I have no problem with dairy consumption. I, raw milk, in fact, um, that's something we could actually go through and I could add to this if I wanted to this presentation because there are many scriptures that talk about actually drinking cow's milk. It, it mentions that in scripture, uh, lands of milk and honey, and there's all kinds of debates on honey. Is honey kosher because it's the bee vomit? Um, if, <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. Listen, an animal only vomits when it's sick. If you're saying honey is bee vomit, you're saying the honey is the bee is sick all the time. It's not. It, it's it, it's re and so there's lots of scripture to back that up. But as far as milk, I'm totally fine with milk. And there's some people who say you shouldn't drink it because it's too it's not meant for humans to drink. I would disagree and say scripture says exactly the opposite. I, yeah, yes. Huh. Um. I don't. The question is, do you eat kidneys? And I don't. Um, it's a kosher animal. In my opinion, the animal itself entirely is kosher. There's no rules given on exceptions for that. There's some interpretations on Jewish tradition for exceptions, but I don't see those interpretations in scripture, those specifics in scripture. So um, I know some people like the heart, some people like the liver, some people like um, the, uh, uh, the kidneys. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't really eat it, but you know, I don't think there's any, any prohibition in scripture. I don't see it. Yes, sir. Um, no, it's because it's the it's the on the outside when you yeah when you pull the skin off there's a giant glob of fat on a lot of these rumps even on even on regular animals but on that particular breed it was more enhanced and so underneath that the meat is fine to eat. Um, but there's no meat inside that fat. It's just fat. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> That's exactly what it's talking about. 
And so when I started, because I make the same thing, I grind up my meat and I want something, because venison is very lean, it doesn't have very hardly any fat in it at all. So it, it's better if I put something that's a little bit fatter inside there. Well, a lot of people, when they make uh, the hard salami in my country, they will find the suet or they will find some of this inner uh, uh, fat to mix in with it. And once I figured that out, what that was, I don't do it anymore, because that's the fat it's talking about. The alternative is this. Uh, you go out and you find the, the fattier meat from an animal, from a sheep or from a cow, and then you mix it in, okay, with your other meat. Just make sure they haven't put suet in there, something that you don't know about. Um, so what I've tried to do is buy it before it's ground and I grind it myself, that way I know it for a fact exactly what is in it so that I don't put any of that fat in there. Yes, sir. Um, so a question from Facebook Live about blood transfusions. So it's very popular in America for a, a, a sect of Christianity uh, called the Jehovah's Witnesses. They do not do blood transfusions at all. There is nothing in scripture, in my opinion, that prevents that. Um, and in fact, I think to not do it would be, um, it's, it's, there's nothing against life. life. The Father loves life. He wants us to you know, have life more abundantly and have it more abundantly. And so simple, simple medical uh, tasks like that, which today are very simple to do, um, why deny yourself that? So I, I, don't, I don't see any restrictions at all whatsoever in Scripture for that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're back real quick. Yeah, I don't see I don't see any prevention in that. I mean, I mean, if you could pick someone who you knew was healthy and you know, you know, it's hard. How much pork did he eat in his life? You know, it's just you, you don't know. But in a perfect world, it would be fine because no one would be eating that stuff anyway. So I don't I don't see a prohibition again in any of that. Yes, sir. yes, ma'am. Yeah, I believe I can because there's nothing in Torah that prevents that. That's an oral tradition that was created by rabbis, as well intentioned as they are. I just don't see it in scripture. Um, I do see over, I mean, I see Ab Abraham, he had meat with cheese that one time. You see that in scripture. And if it's okay for Abraham, it's probably okay for you. Oh, the lamb, all right. Right. So there's two things. Uh, there's two different um, examples. There's a kind of a debate on this where I come from, and that they say that there's some historical evidence that the, the pagans would boil a kid in its mother's milk and they would toss it and, and, and dedicate it to the crops. However, I see only a very few little tiny pieces of evidence for this in historical writings. Okay, someone has yet to show me historical writings, the actual historical writings where it says that. So we had an experience um, a couple years ago, and I'll tell you, I'll end it with this, and we'll go off the questions, and we'll get ready to move on to what's next, okay? But I had an experience uh, from my neighbors. Both, it was two, two different neighbors that I had the same experience. They had gotten a young lamb, a young baby lamb, and they were going to use that for Passover, okay? And because there's a lot of Hebrews who live in my area, and even some of my very close neighbors are Hebrews, and we all get a lamb for our families, and we all do Passover. Um, with our families. Well, they had gotten two young lambs, these two neighbors, and they were, it was very young. And during the process of holding the lamb down and getting ready to slit its throat, the lamb began to suck on the finger of both my neighbors when they were doing their, when their thing, because it was still in milk. And so at that point, they realized maybe this is what that verse means. It came to them both separate, you know, this revelation. And it makes sense because there's other scriptures that are kind of similar where it says, do not take the young from the same time you take the mom. And so when you're, when you're taking a child away from its mother when it's still in milk, maybe we shouldn't do that. To me, that makes a whole lot more sense. Yeah. So um, again, no one has yet showed me scriptural or, or even historical evidence of this whole pagan ritual that people did. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Um, but I think it makes a whole lot more sense that when you slaughter an animal, you should do something that's a little more mature, still under a year, you know, a few months old. They're not, they're, they're not, they shouldn't be, you know, really on milk anymore from its mother anyway. 
But something that young, yeah, that, that makes more sense to me.